You can yell as much as you want. I mean, we're interrupting your work day. Okay. Okay, ya está haciendo un video de mí y me dijo que tengo que gritarles. Oh, she hit the whip, you know that? <laughs> Para que los estudiantes saben que es verdadero, de verdad, right? <laughs> and look, I'm even all prepped, see? Because I got my socks and they don't match. Yay me. <laughs> all right. All right. Hi, Kathleen. Hi. Would you like to introduce yourself to my no. viewers? I'm Kathleen <laughs> Castanella. I own a sewing factory in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I'm a pattern maker. 35 years. Wow. Yeah, 35 years. Can you talk us through the process of hiring a sewing factory from the first phone call to order delivery? That's a nightmare. For one thing, the very the very best thing you should do, in my opinion, is you you your pattern maker should facilitate that whole thing, okay? Your pattern maker should do it because your pattern maker is going to know who's good, who's not good. It forces them to develop relationships with people. Um, and basically the pattern maker is the technical counterpart between design and production. So what if you don't have a pattern maker? Then you need to get one. Uh, how would you do that? <laughs> I'm just trying to put myself in the mindset of my viewers and okay. what, okay. what okay. question like they would ask you. All right, somebody like you. Okay. And and probably your students. They know how to make some patterns. Mm -hmm. You know, they know how to, they have pattern making. They probably, maybe they even enjoy it and they can sew a little. And that's awesome. That's perfect. The point is, though, is that before you go to a factory, your patterns need to come up a whole other level. Mm -hmm. okay, for one thing, most people, we're a very small factory, but we still have to have everything digitized. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do things by hand, sure, for sure. But the thing is, though, is that when I get stuff, if I want to look at it, I want to look at it in the computer because I need to make, I want to see what the yield is, what the allocation is going to be on this, and tell people so I can tell them how much fabric they need to order and that kind of thing. So if you're not computerized yet, I would say that you need to do that. Okay. Okay. So go to somebody who's good, and it's, it's terrible these days. How do you find somebody who's good? You know, <laughs> somebody says I'm good. It's like this is the this is the terrible thing, and this is the thing that people today do not understand. Is that you want to go. You try to get referrals from your fabric salesman, from a factory that you've, if you've been talking to a factory, say, hey, who do you guys like, mm -hmm. you know? But the one way you don't want to find a factory, find a, sewing, a pattern maker, is to go online and find somebody who's got this gorgeous site and says, I'm a pattern maker and I have so much experience. And then they show you all these pictures of customers' product that they've made. Okay. Okay. Why do we not want that? Because do you want, I mean... You want to have your product all over the internet so anybody can download it before you've even had a chance to take it to market or sell it to your customers, seriously? And that you just don't ever do that. Mm -hmm. You go, what you want to do is you want to hire somebody who looks like they've got a site from 1995. <laughs> or 1993, I swear to God. Okay? I look. Basically, <laughs> one page, I'm serious, maybe mm -hmm. one page, maybe a contact page, and it looks very, very old school. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who obviously don't spend any time on there, okay? Um, you want to hire, you can look for pattern makers, but you always want to look and see if they post pictures of their customers' products. Mm -hmm. That's that's very uncool. Mm -hmm. That is very uncool. And you see a lot of people, young people doing it these days, and it's like, you know, if you have to feed off of your customers, borrow your customers' cachet in order to make a point for yourself, you know, you must not be very good, in my mm -hmm. opinion. And a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when I, you know, because I get a lot of pattern makers trying to get me to get them work and stuff, so I do the full makeup. I'm, I mean, I'll go all over their social media, I'll go to their websites, mm -hmm. I'll do everything. And if they've got customers' product up, no, I don't send them any work. Yeah, I don't put up illustrations from like no. freelance clients no. on my Instagram no. or anything. All of that is just like doodling I do on the yeah. side. And, exactly. Yeah. You don't put customers' work up. Yeah. No, that's slimy. So, but anyway, you go to somebody... Who you go to, I've got a huge website. Huge. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, seriously. You know, as, as far as people on this side of the business, it's probably the largest site easily, mm -hmm. with no exaggeration. 3,000 posts. 
And in there, you'll see customer's product, I don't know, maybe once, because the customer, you know, wanted me to put it up there for some reason. Mm -hmm. Once. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just not cool. But anyway, so, you know, there's there's ways to do it. We do it on our, you know, people who get the book that I wrote and sign up for the form. That's a good way to do it, you know. So when you are trying to find a pattern maker and you found someone with a decrepit 1993 website awesome. with no photos of anybody's work and you contact them, then what's the next step in figuring out if they're any good or not? Give them something to do? Like give them a test project and be like, can you draft something? Um, well, but let's say you said that your people already have some patterns. They already have some patterns. They already have some. Well, I have viewers who have nothing. Oh, Come right. interrupt us. It's fine. Um, yeah, I have viewers all over, like some who went to school and can do some patterns or have a little bit of experience. I have viewers who have nothing. Like they're watching my channel as background information because okay. they want to get started. Okay. So let me find this. Um, I've got I've got several posts on this blog, so I'm, I'm just I mean I write this stuff down, so I don't have to keep repeating myself. If you don't mind. No, it's awesome because I tell so, people to go to your website, but if you tell them that you have a post on it already, then right. they can go look it up themselves. Because I say that to my viewers all the time. It's like, yeah, I made a video on that. That this is the title. Go okay. watch this. Do set up appointments more if you can. Don't expect to pay for the interview the first meeting unless the situation evolves into a consulting session. They should tell you so, and what will it cost? Okay. Will they give you a quote on the spot? No. It depends. Okay. It depends on the company. Usually they won't. Um, your package is incomplete. What you can expect is ballpark estimate. I'm just reading this web, this mm -hmm. post that these people can see themselves. They should tell you their hourly rate and how long it typically takes for this sort of job. Usually these costs will be itemized as separate charges. You don't have to take all the recommended services. Depends on your needs. Okay. Here are basic items you should receive quotes for. The sketch, if it's not ready, the pattern, cutting a sample, sewing a sample. Okay? Um, I suggest you get quotes for services you will need after the pattern and sampling is done because you may not want to switch horses. Okay? And want to make sure those services downstream are competitive. A lot of the old school pattern makers don't actually offer sampling services. Mm -hmm. There's this other post I wrote that it's like, you know, it's really hard for people to see it because they're just coming into the business now, so they don't have a before shot, you know? A lot of this stuff happened before you came around, too. But this one is called Bewildered by Sewing Factory, Bewildered by Pattern Services. This is a really good one. But this one says, like, why can you only find patterns? You can only find pattern makers who make patterns or gray patterns, but not both. That sounds crazy to people, okay? But that's traditionally how things were. And this explains why, okay? Why don't pattern makers write sewing instructions and all this other stuff? Anyway, once you are going to move forward with with a, um, I mean, it depends on the factor. You know, you've got, you've got somebody. You're like a cat with that. With that one. <laughs> What am I supposed to do? <laughs> like a little ball of yarn. <laughs> you know, it depends. It depends. A lot of times people are going to just tell you stuff to just to get rid of you. Yeah. Yeah, if you the, don't come across well, the Well, the big, problem, the big problem is, is we get a lot of people, and they have the wrong idea about this business. Mm. And they think that the, the whole industry is war-torn and starving, and we're, like, you know, basically killing each other for work. <laughs> you know? Seriously. Okay. Seriously. So they all think that we're just starving. So we get these calls from people and they're really arrogant. Mm -hmm. You know, and they act, they're used to consumer services. They're used to going to, you know, what I call Burger King. You know, mm -hmm. they're used to going to Burger King and having everybody kiss their butts. Mm -hmm. Will not happen here. Mm -hmm. Just will not happen. We don't need your money. Mm -hmm. We don't. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, nobody, you're just going to go out into the world and embarrass us. You know, we can't refer you to anybody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Is that not coming clear? <laughs> just saying they're going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I mean, you and I have known each other for a long time, so mm -hmm. we've had some of these conversations before, but I want that to be really clear to my viewers. Yeah. And a lot of them are, I mean, 
they just have no idea what the industry is like at yeah. all. And they're watching my videos because they want to yeah. get some sense. And that's why the interview series is popular amongst that crowd mm -hmm. because it gives them a realistic look because, right. you know, it's people who are actually working. Right. right. Yeah, it's just hard. I mean, just don't be a jerk. You know, don't mm -hmm. be a jerk and don't assume that people are out there to, you know, to... I mean, people aren't out there to screw you either. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just like any other. You know, we need the the issue that we have is th this is the big problem dealing with a small company. The big problem with a small company, especially a brand new company, it's it's like it's getting to the point I don't want to deal with them now. It's gotten so bad. It's gotten so bad because they've never hired anybody before. Because they've never hired anybody, they have no idea what to expect from them relationship mm -hmm. and so I can give them all these services and give them this awesome stuff you know really give them the white glove treatment you know but because I'm the first person they've ever dealt with and they might get pissed off at something or think I'm too expensive you know so they go off and they're mm -hmm. all pissed off and they don't even know how good they had it mm -hmm. you see what I mean and not just me but somebody else I've, seen, I've gotten other people too and they would you know really trash the other person that they were with and and it's like that doesn't seem like a bad thing at all. And it's like, why did you, I mean, I ask these people, why did you leave? Mm -hmm. Because I couldn't understand it. <clears throat> so it's hard to do work for somebody who has no experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to make patterns with somebody who's never hired a pattern maker anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just awful. You know? Um, so. Well, it's not your job to teach them. And well, I think, they think it is. Yeah, they come into the factory thinking, well, I'm paying you X amount of right. dollars, so part of that is right. you teaching me, right? That's what they think. Yeah. They think that that's my job. And it's like, no, my, I, I sell time. That's what I sell. I sell time. How you want to use that time is completely up to you. It's completely up to you. So if that time is spent counseling you or telling you to have resources or, um, you know, I don't know, just any range of things, discussing your project with you or a better way to sell it or whatever, or actual pattern making, actual cutting. It's, we charge everything by the hour. You know, we don't, we don't do anything for free because, and that's a problem with a, with a new company that's really small, is they require intensive care. You know, they require a lot of attention. I understand that. And you get people that are really great. I mean, they're just super, super nice and everything. So you want to help them. And I had one company like that that I just got rid of, like, you know, within the last 10 days. Super nice people from Oregon, you know, and they, and this is what so many people do. They say, so do you have any feedback for me? You know, and the whole time I've been giving them feedback, you know, you, you need to X, Y, Z, you know, but they don't ever do it. Mm -hmm. But they keep asking you for feedback and keep saying, we're very open to feedback. What they mean is, is they want you to give them, you know, feedback that they feel is actionable. You know, you give people a list of three things to do. First, get your fabric. Two, hire a pattern maker. Three, get a factory. They look at that and they think, oh, that's a list of options. You know, is that lettuce or tomatoes or onions? And, <laughs> you know, not all three and not necessarily in that order. So they'll pick out one item from that list. You know, oh, factory. Oh, I'll go to the factory. And then they wonder why nobody will give them the time of day. Yeah, there is an order of operations. Yeah, it's this. not a bullet point list, you know, pick whichever one of those you like. <laughs> not multiple choice. No. Order no, of operations. No, no. Yeah, and they get upset because they're the customer and you should be doing what they say. No, like I was explaining in the wholesale video, it's like you can't just go up to a sales rep and be like, you, rep my stuff. It has to be a back and forth, like figuring it out together, figuring out Hold what the sales second. rep is going to do. Yeah, figuring out what the sales rep is going to do and then what you're going to do, what you have to prepare for them to do their job. And, you know, it's that whole back and forth relationship and not right. just do this. Do right. That. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, and the problems we've got now is, you know, we have, there's, there's so much business, you know, and our problem is we don't have anybody to do the work, you know. I turned out so much work. It's it's crazy. You know, I'd have job. I'd have work for at least three more people if I could, you know, get the people. So, yeah, that was going to be one of my questions is what are the biggest problems facing kind of U.S. stone car manufacturing? Labor. That's number one. 
labor. You see, you know. So people, all these people say that they can't find a job. What does that mean? Well, they're looking for jobs as fashion designers. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I didn't even have to laugh. You did. I feel like I'm allowed to laugh because I'm a designer, mm -hmm. and I you know I hear it all the time. It's like, well, I don't want to do that. I want to be the designer. Okay. And oh, I remember I had a student who. She was a design major, mm -hmm. and she transferred into tech design, mm -hmm. product development. Right. And all of her friends were like, why did you do that? Because she has a brain. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, don't give her a hard time. If that's what she wants to do, and she thinks she's going to be successful there, leave her alone. And you're like, why don't you want to be a designer? She's like, and it was funny because she was looking at me kind of funny because I was... She was in my drawing class, and so she kind of looked at me like this, and then she's like, well, I really don't like drawing, and I really don't like coming up with ideas. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, but I like making clothes. I like... She should have been a pattern maker. Well, I think that was kind of like her... Like, she was only a sophomore at that point, but she had just switched to product development, and that was... Her thing. She was going to switch her classes to more, like, more construction-heavy classes. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yeah, I like making clothes. I just don't want to think them up. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, you know, go for what you want. Well, pattern makers make more than designers. Oh, my God. I tell this to people all they the time. Just don't, they just don't. Yeah. So, yeah, my I want to talk about manufacturing in the U.S., sewn product manufacturing in the U.S., and, you know, what its problems are. I had a viewer who wanted to ask you, L.E.T. asks, could you ask Kathleen her thoughts on the current political climate and how it could impact fashion manufacturing? Is she doing something to prepare for potential turmoil slash changes in tariffs, etc.? Um, you know, it's a tough situation. Um, <clears throat> well, for one, I've gotten hit with this question already a couple mm -hmm. of times with, with customers that um, they think that this is going to be really good for us. And really? Why do they think that? Because we're not in the business and they don't know how it works. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, they think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it could be really bad for supply, number one, because a lot of our fabrics come offshore because we still don't have domestic sources of supply and hardware and stuff like that. But it, although that is coming back. Um, but it's really going to hurt consumers. It's really going to hurt consumers a lot. And it's not really... All it's going to do is put more of a, a crimp. It, it just... Like right now we have... We don't have all the workers that we need. Okay? So I don't know how creating tariffs and all that kind of stuff is going to improve that situation. You know, we have people... We can't get people into, into chairs. They don't want to do that. So I don't know how raising tariffs is going to solve that problem for us. All it's going to do is for people who who are, you know, financially constrained and have, you know, severe budgetary problems, all it's going to do is eliminate their choices, you know? I mean, it's going to hurt the people who can least afford it. You know, for us, it's, it's I don't think, at least in the short term, it's not going to make much of a, of a difference either way. We already have people that are wanting to produce here for whatever reason, you know, because for one thing, producing here in the U.S. is not that expensive as, as people think. Yeah, a lot of people think that they would like to do U.S. made, yeah. but it'll end up with products that are too expensive, like more than they wanted their mm -hmm. products to cost. Yeah, well it could be, it's just that people are using an outdated, an outdated playbook. You know, it used to be in the olden days, quote unquote, 20 years ago, when, you, you know, you had a, you had a, a mix of how your finances went, you know, who you gave money to or whatever, right? So, and now the mix has got gotten to, the, you know, I mean, marketing was always a, was a portion of that pie, but it was a relatively small portion of that pie. Your marketing basically, for the most part, for most manufacturers was you had road reps. You know, they went out and they serviced the stores that they had, and so you covered their commissions plus whatever expenses they had. You didn't do a lot of, you know, consumer oriented marketing unless you were like something like, you know, Levi's or something like that, you know, unless you were a huge global brand. And most people did pretty well. These days, the and so you had this small, relatively you know, small marketing budget, and 
the majority of your expenses actually went into production and pre-product development. So you actually paid more for production then than people you know want to because what's happened is, is things have turned they've decided you know i actually want to spend a lot more on marketing than i ever did before so i'm going to make production pay for that and the way they're going to make production pay for that is to send the work offshore okay so they basically they're still spending as much money as they ever did it's just how they allocate that spending has changed now it's all in marketing so now everybody thinks that's what you have to do you have to spend all this money and stuff on marketing and it's like well maybe you don't you know, maybe you can reallocate that, you know, find out before you try to fix something that's broken, find out how we did it first, mm. you know, and figure out what the holes, what are the weaknesses, you know, these regional shows, for example, for people to get into, and they are awesome, you know, and I don't see anybody, nobody asks me about that, you know, nobody asks me, you know, it's what's appalling are the questions that people do not ask me, but anyway, so I'm, I don't think that this these trade barriers or tariffs or whatever we're talking is really going to do much but hurt us. Mm. You know, and I say that as somebody who produces here in the U.S. We don't do any offshore work at all. We don't do anything. So, I mean, we do... But your customers bring in imported goods for you to sell. Yes. What's happening, we're having more people that are figuring out that between the turnaround on stuff mm -hmm. and then it's like they have fit problems. Like you saw this morning we were working on those ladies, you know, that lady's yoga pants or stretch, mm -hmm. whatever they were. So what people are realizing is that they actually want to have time. The time is more important to them than money. And so they have, if they're, they have all their stuff done offshore, so they send it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until they get everything nailed down, but some people are like, you know, I'm really tired of doing that. So they'll bring their product here and we'll do the fit, you know, we'll correct the fit and then, you know, send them a pattern that their factory can use in China to, you know, produce their goods. Mm -hmm. So we do that. And then we have, um, we have a lot of people, actually we've had probably, I don't know, about three different customers over the last year that are bringing their production back from China. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their problem is, is the Chinese won't give them their patterns. So, you know, we get their product mm -hmm. in here. Yeah. I don't blame them because the customer didn't pay for it. Ah, uh, okay. okay. You're only entitled right. to what you pay for. Right. So, okay. And that's the whole reason why, to you, this is so important that your viewers need to understand, is that you should always pay for the pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you go straight to a factory and the factory does the product for you and does the pattern for you, you don't own that pattern. So good luck if you want to change, if you want to switch, if you want to go somewhere else, you know? Well, to me, like the pattern <clears throat> is like almost the last stage of the design, right? Because that's when it's finalized. Like that's, those are the proportions it's going to be. That's the final fit. You know, and that no. really, like. No, I think patterns should come in sooner than that. No, what I mean is like once you have a final pattern, okay. that's really when the design is finalized. Yeah. People think design is finalized when it's a flat sketch, but oh. it changes so much oh, in yeah. the product development process mm -hmm. that the design isn't finished until you have your final pattern done. Right. Yeah. Because and so if you don't have that, then yeah. you've lost your design really. Exactly. Exactly. Your tagline <laughs> on your website, the sustainable factory floor, uh -huh. what does sustainable mean to you? Because I think that we get a lot of greenwashing, green, oh, yeah. like there's a lot of stuff floating around out there and I would like to hear what you consider sustainable. Well, sustainable means that you're not wasteful and everybody mm. thinks that they're not wasteful. They all think that they're lean and they're not. So <clears throat> what the, the key component is that people should only cut to order, you know, but it's just people think, oh, well, I'm green because... My um, my contractor has so a couple of solar panels on, on the roof, you know, mm -hmm. or they're here in the U.S. or that's that's not what sustainable is. Oh, you know what? I think <clears throat> one of the first blog posts I ever read of yours when I first found you was you were uh, talking about push versus pull manufacturing. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Push versus pull manufacturing. And you know I've been writing about that for 12 years. Mm -hmm. Actually, more than that, I've been doing sustainability stuff well before it was popular. Yeah, people think like, oh, my stuff's made of bamboo, I'm totally sustainable. No, it's not. No, no it's some of the most polluting um, textile production that there is. Actually, it is the most polluting that there is. 
So, because all the chemicals involved exactly. in making that fabric. Exactly. There's three super fun clean cleanup sites. The three worst super fun clean EPA super fun cleanup sites in the U.S. are all former rayon plants. And excuse me, bamboo is rayon. Right. That's what it is. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it's no. like the worst thing you can do. Number one. But everybody thinks it's awesome, you know. And it used to be okay because it was waste product that just grew whatever. But now that it's become popular. Now it's become a monoculture into itself. They're cutting down, you know, jungles and stuff so they can plant bamboo. When the whole selling point of it was that it wasn't a monoculture. Yeah. Oh my God, that's yeah. so. Oh, that's so. I know. So it's like horrible. You want to know? You want to know what I think people should do? Yeah, I want to hear all the things. Okay, this is what. And, Lay it on us. And do not ask me. Do not ask me how to go about doing because I don't know. <laughs> I haven't ever found anybody who's interested in doing it, so why am I going to do the work, mm -hmm. you know, because the information will change. Okay. If people really are interested in sustainability, they should buy transitional cotton. Do you know what transitional cotton is? No. No, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, transitional. It's okay when somebody, when a grower is becoming is is um, becoming organic. The grower has to use organic processes, you know, with no chemicals and all this other kind of stuff for five long years before they can get the organic certification. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in other words, for five long years, that farmer is investing. He can't or she can't use, you know, these things that are proven. To to increase yields, you know, to get rid of bugs and all this other kind of stuff. So they have mm -hmm. these these excessively high costs, but their product can only be sold in the regular cotton market, not in the premium organic cotton market. It's terrible. So basically for five long years, you have to survive for five years before you can get that stamp of approval and sell your cotton in a premium market. So this leftover unorganic... It's transitional. It's transitional from traditional mm -hmm. growing to organic. So previously, what have they been doing with that cotton? No, they use it. It gets sold into the regular market. Oh, okay. But what I'm saying is you don't get the premium price because it's regular cotton. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so that pricing would be in between because it's not full organic yet. Right, right. Okay, now I'm going to tell you something else that's not, not going to make people. It's not going to make people happy. They're not going to want to hear this. Do you know who the biggest buyer of transitional cotton is in the world? Lay it on me. Think of the worst retail bad guy you can think of. I don't know, Walmart? Yeah. Oh! <laughs> God damn it! I hate it when I'm right about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Ugh. They are the biggest buyer of transitional cotton in the world. So I'm not I'm not I'm not a Walmart apologist and I certainly don't know much about them, you know, but I do know that. And so, and they pay a premium for that over regular, the price of regular cotton, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, so that way that they can sustain those growers mm -hmm. until they can actually jump into the, you know, primary, the uh, premium markets. So but then they never, do they ever buy the organic once it's organic? Yes, or? they do. Oh, okay. Yeah. But the thing is, is transitional cotton. I think that's awesome. I think that's because they're paying a pre, they're paying a premium over regular cotton. Do you see what I'm saying? So they're actually and it encourages yes, people to get yes, into more yes, organic. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And so what I think needs to happen, I think that there needs to be right now to encourage farmers to go that route. You know, to really, if you really care about sustainability, you know, it's spending your dollars, not the last leg. It's like think back. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. So it would be great if they, if there were a transitional cotton market specifically goods made from transitional cotton and that designers would buy these goods and they would they would have a special tag a special licensing deal and say this is transitional cotton this is why this is awesome for you the consumer this is why you need to support me support the farmers you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. and so i mean help people get there yeah you know yeah because if you have such a long investment period and you have to just suffer and keep losing money during five years, like nobody wants to deal with that. And so people No, they'll go gonna, broke. Yeah. They'll go broke. It's not serving anyone. Yeah. Okay. It's not serving anybody.
it's a whole thing so, I've not even thought about before. Yeah, but people can be sustainable by by um, people just want to buy their way into sustainability. They think they can just buy the right thing, and you know, it's like a magic wand. Ding, you know. They're but not I sustainable. think sustainable is more in process. It, it it's actually that you don't that the people don't really think about. It's it's in it's in what the designers do. It's like they call me up and um, you know this customer that we're working with right now is you know pretty good. But like a customer calls me up and they say, okay, I want a hundred of this. I'm like, okay, do you have orders for those? No, but and it's like, no, we're not going to make them. Okay, this makes my customers really mad. But guess what? Do you know how many of my customers go broke? Mm -hmm. Not many. Because they listen to you? Well, if they don't <laughs> listen to me, they go elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because how do you, you know, it, that that affects my reputation. And besides, it took me however long to break them in, right? <laughs> you know, I don't have to start over with somebody else. Be a pain in the butt. So, you know, and like one customer I had who was very, very pushy, just would not take no for an answer, and I fired him like three different times, and he kept coming back. I did it for him. I finally broke down. I did it for him because he said he had catalog orders. He didn't. So, I mean, we must have made like 400 products for him, 400 different things. Mm -hmm. And I had to donate them all. He went under. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's when people over-order, and I know how hard it is. You know, and we can get to, we can talk about that, too, why people don't want small orders. You know, one... I talked, I mean, I know that's a problem. People want to have a large order so that a factory will take them on. Mm -hmm. But that's not why the factory doesn't take them, okay? The factory doesn't want small orders for completely different reasons that they'll tell you because they're using a different paradigm than the customer, mm -hmm. okay? Um, basically, a customer, I mean, a, con a factory, a contract has to charge you for all their time. So in the olden days, the way, and it still is, you know, people that do this are thinking as rolled around. We give you a package price for something. We figure, you know, you have to have a thousand of these and it's going to be $5 a piece or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the reason, a, a lot of that, it's not just sewing time, but it's the amount of time that went into cutting. Cutting is something that almost nobody understands and it terrifies me. Okay. So cutting is the one reason why a contractor will not want to do a small order. Okay. And so my feeling is, is I'd rather tell my customers about this. I'd rather tell people about it. And then that way we can work together to figure out the most economical way to do things. So we technically have no minimums in this factory. Mm -hmm. But I charge for cutting separately. Okay. So which is good and bad. One, if it takes us two hours to cut out your, your outfits or whatever, we're going to charge you you know, two hours of labor for that. And then the sewing time is separate. Mm -hmm. um, in a traditional factory, they just roll the cutting and the sewing all together, but then they'll only make, they have a minimum order quantity. Mm -hmm. You know, do you see what I'm saying? Yes. So we do it, you know, we're more transparent with our pricing. Okay. Sometimes people appreciate that, and then other people don't. They expect the high quantity, you know, pricing to, to apply to two items, you know. 